Welcome to another episode of the Byproduct Podcast. I am your host, Ian Pruckner, and I'm so thankful you're spending a couple of minutes with us together, getting better together, because when we get better, things get better. I'm here with a friend of mine, Chris Lee, who's an absolute killer in the entrepreneur space, serial entrepreneur, big exit, doing something amazing right now, investing in the lives and the businesses of founders all over the country. Chris, welcome. And you're also dressed as a Christmas tree, which I love. It's amazing. Oh, baby, let's get the hood on for this thing. Get the uh, star. Come on. <laughs> you got the star. Okay. Come on. All right. What more, do you, want? What more I, do you want? I don't think, I don't think more is possible, Chris. I don't, <laughs> for a po I don't know what we can do. I mean, it, that's another level. I could prove you wrong. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's another level. Well, welcome to the show. It's it's been fun. Uh, you know, we connected through a mutual friend. We've uh, done a couple of things together here. Uh, another podcast, just some one on ones, and, and you're just a, a lot of fun. Uh, the energy is great, and I have a lot of fun connecting with you. And that's amazing, right? Because as entrepreneurs, sometimes it's not so fun. But how we approach things and and who we are and how we show up to things matters, right? And 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 being able to make things fun and exciting and enjoyable, showing up in a dadgum Christmas you know, tree outfit, that's, that's what it's all about, right? So I love it. Um, so let's just jump right in, right? So, so like you're a serial entrepreneur, you, you've done a number of things, you just had a, a big exit. Uh, you're a, the founder and chairman of, of Soul Gen Power, right? Out of, out of Utah. Couple, out of Washington, Washington out of, State. Out of Washington State, okay. Couple hundred million dollar a year business. Right, not not a not a small not a small business. Right, not operating out of your garage. How many employees do you guys have there at the business? Uh, we're we're just uh, just over a thousand right now. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it, you know, you say not operating out of your garage. The funny thing is, so it started out of your garage, probably. It did, yes. We, we <laughs> of just, course. We just did hit our six year anniversary, and our first two and a half years, the the national headquarters was my shop, was my my garage. It was uh, we had fifty. The day we moved out of my garage, we had fifty three people showing up there every single day, running off a of residential internet. It was it was wild. Dude, that had to either be a big garage or an OSHA violation, one of the two, <laughs> maybe both. <laughs> Hey, we'll, we'll keep that on the download. So, so what's really interesting about this story to me, right, it is six years. I mean, you built from zero to 250 million a year in six years out of your garage, but you exited, you were staying on as a CEO and, you know, through a number of, of transactions and changes there now, you, you're the chairman of that company. You're not involved in the day to day really at all. Um, and it's still growing, still flourishing. And that is the sign of a great leader, right? A great leader. The, the business is the shadow of who they are and what they stood for and what they built. And, and clearly you built something very, very special there and a culture that's very special that after going through a transition of ownership, maybe moving out of the day to day into an executive role, then moving out of that into more of an advisory role. And yet it's still growing. It's that is the sign to me. That is the sign of somebody who knows how to build something that it continues to move after they're gone. Right. Any, anybody with great, enthusiasm and great charisma can dance on the stage for the people while they're there. But what happens when they're not there anymore? Right. And, and talk to me like two, three principles that allowed you to build something so quick, relatively quickly. I mean, six years is a long time, but not a long time, relatively quickly that, that has endured through those transitions and is such a great business today, especially in, in that space, right? Because there are, there are other people in that space. It's not a blue ocean out there by any stretch of the imagination, which means you did something really unique. You did something different. What was that thing? Yeah, so first and foremost, I'm gonna use some buzzwords like uh, the word culture, right? So uh, culture was our number one focus from day one. And a lot of people hear the word, they, they can feel a good one. They know when a, there's a bad one, but very few know how to put their finger on like what makes a great culture. And so that, that's been the focus of my professional career is like figuring out what makes an incredible culture and how you can become an architect of incredible culture. And so through my experience of failed businesses, working for others, studying different CEOs, spending over a million dollars on my personal education, uh, I have come with a pretty good game plan, uh, a pretty good roadmap of, of how to create incredible culture. And so day one, operating out of my garage, you know, I have a 3,500 square foot shop garage. And initially only about 400 square feet of it was finished. And that's where we were operating out of. And, you know, there's six of us in there and we're, 
you know, uh, working in a not a great environment from a standpoint of like the AC didn't work and, you know, all, all these different things. But and there, there was a huge emphasis on culture. And, and when, when I talk about emphasis on culture, there's a few things. Like one, you got to make sure that your vision and mission of the business is like dialed in from day one and you're getting people to buy in. So, you know, day one, I'm sitting in this 400 square foot garage and we're like, and I'm like, hey, we are going to take this thing. We are going to be the largest solar installer in the nation. And, and you know, most people are looking at me like I'm crazy, right? Because we're, we're sitting in this shop. Uh, you know, people are sweating. And they're just like, dude, oh, like, what, what are you? What are you talking about? Right? But it was something that I that I saw and I envisioned, and I implemented core values and interactions, a culture of trust, a culture of transparency, uh, you know, a, a culture of accountability, and and all the different core values from from the very beginning. And I did different types of interactions. Like culture is a lot of like the common words and, and the, the common language that you use and the common interaction. Like every single morning I'd come in the door and I'd be like, good morning. And I go around and I give everyone a high five, ask them how their day was. And, and this was something until the day that I stepped down as CEO, I continued to do. And, you know, later when at our corporate headquarters, we had three to 350 employees, this interaction took me over an hour on a daily basis wow. to, to go and do it. But it was something that people had come to expect and, and come to know and trust and realize that, hey, the CEO it really does care about who I am, what I'm becoming. And so that was that was like number one is, is focus on culture. Number two would be an aspect of culture on building a culture of per people development, right? Hmm. From, from, from day one, whenever an employee walked through our doors, we let them know, hey, this isn't just another place where you're going to get a paycheck. We want you to become the best version of yourself and the, and really our mission, which was building a brighter future for our people. And and I know that in, in building a brighter future for our people, it's not just the money aspect, right? We, we focused on the physical, the economic, the associations and the spirituality of each of our, of our people. And they knew it because they, we would do different things. Like for example, on Fridays, I would do an optional meeting at, Fridays during lunch for 30 minutes, we call it financial Fridays and in which people could actually attend. And we talked about personal finance and how to invest and become financially free, even on an employee wage and doing things that were over and above what a standard employer would do. Or, you know, we, we talk about spiritual aspects, you know, there was always a focus of prayer. Uh, you know, uh, we, we had like different things where we would do potlucks as a, as a company and we come together and we would pray and give thanks. And, and, uh, you know, I would always in any speech I, I would be giving to my group, it would be a focus on God and, and, and building relationships and being better husbands and fathers and contributors to society. And, uh, and so, you know, th like those were the foundational aspects in which we built our business and people were naturally became attractive. And so the cool thing is, is as we moved out of our garage and we built this big, beautiful national headquarters and we customized it to our culture and what we did and everything else, like it became that much more easy for us to attract a great talent and great producers right. because not only did we have the culture, but then we had the facilities and we had all, all the cool yeah, it's things. It's a flywheel. Once it starts, yeah. it takes yeah. off. And, you know, there, there was one point uh, my last year running the business, man, it, you know, it, and things have, uh, I'll, be, I'll be frank, things have slowed down with the economy. Interest rates going from 2% to 8%. It, it's not quite the same growth that we once experienced where we were experiencing 300% growth a year. And, uh, you know, the, I mean, there was, there was points in our business that we would have 25 to 30 people starting like every Monday, you know, and, and I would step in and give like a vision statement of like, this is what we're building. And, you know, we're here to take over the world. We are going to be the Amazon of the Tri-Cities. Uh, you know, we're going to transform Eastern Washington the same way that Walmart transferred North, tra uh, uh, completely transfigured Northwest Arkansas, right? Like, and, and so like, these are the vision statements that we were creating yeah. and, and uh, you know, people got into it and bought behind it and they, you know, they're still, they're still there. And uh, you know, the, uh, but, but those, those are definitely the, the keys yeah. to building. That's so good. A couple of points I want to hit on here, right? So, so number one is your vision and 
you know, you did a great job of creating a vision that was big enough that other people could fit their lives and their dreams inside of your dreams, right? And, and that's a key. I think a lot of people don't realize that thinking small basically prohibits you from ever getting big, right? Because you repel big thinkers because they want more than what you want in your life. And so being able to have these sort of outlandish visions, being cast in a garage and sweltering heat, right? But that nobody sees but you, but staying committed to that vision over long periods of time and people buy into that. But the second thing that I love that you talked about going around and high five, and first of all, I love high fives. I would teach on high fives to my organization. And, and the reason was it's impossible to get a high five and not smile. Just try high fiving, just wherever you are, just go to a stranger on the street, just high five them, okay? They're gonna smile at you, um, you know, but, but you were committed to living the culture. And you would take an hour to go there, as a CEO of a large company like that, that time is valuable time in a lot of ways, right? But you chose to spend that time continuing to reinforce the culture that you set. And a lot of guys that I coach and work with different business leaders are like, why don't my people do this or do what I expect here? Or why are we having these challenges over here? It's because they want people to follow a culture that they haven't totally sold out to, right? It's like, hey, let me tell you these words, but my actions aren't in alignment with those words, right? But, but man, it's like, you know, reading about George Washington and, you know, you'd get these handwritten accounts from these, you know, guppies on the front lines of the revolution. All of a sudden they look to their left and there's General Washington shooting right next to him. And they're like, we would give our lives for this man because he's not commanding us from the back. He's out with us on these lines, right? And that's what great leaders and great entrepreneurs do. They get out there into those trenches and they live the culture. And when you live the culture, it just becomes a byproduct. Everybody else buys into it. That's really, really powerful. Chris, you mentioned a couple, a couple of failed endeavors. So you, know, you have this unbelievable business. You do this exit from it. I mean, you, know, you didn't just fall out of bed one day and stumble on something really successful. You had a couple of false starts along the way. Talk a little bit about that. What did you learn from those things that prepared you and positioned you for the climb that, that you've just gone through in your life? Absolutely. So first and foremost, like my foundation in business, it comes from my, my belief in God and belief in family. Amen. And, and so, you know, I had an opportunity while most people are attending college, I, I was out serving a two year mission for my, my church, preaching Jesus and serving people. And that, that was really where I learned that this is where I'm going to base everything off of what I do for the rest of my life. Second was that my family was the, the most important thing. When I came home off my mission, I married my high school sweetheart two and a half years later at the age of 21. And because for me, I was raised in a family that like having kids, having a, a family, and, and that was like the most prosperous thing that you could have. You know, my, my dad was a school teacher and my mom was a stay at home mom with seven kids. And we, we didn't have a lot of possessions. And, and so you know, but, but the, the focus on the family was, was always so important to me that I, that's what I wanted in my life. And, and so I made it a top priority. I didn't put it off. Um, I married, married my, my lady, Andrea, and uh, we've been married for 18 years. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, you know, we have five beautiful children. And, and uh, so establishing that as the foundation, I went and I, and I pursued different entrepreneurial endeavors. My first one was a massive failure. Tried growing too fast, too quick, raised outside money, um, did it, made a lot of poor mistakes, tried to impress people, um, tried, uh, you know, uh, gutting the business for my own pleasure but well before it was successful, um, you know, just, just all kinds of mistakes. And, uh, you know, two years into that, right in the middle of, of the, uh, the, the Great Recession, you know, I launched that business in 08. The end of 2010, I find myself dodging creditors and and literally having my phone being blown up in and out and and uh, and realizing that I was a massive failure and there was no way out. Um, I made the decision that I had to file bankruptcy in order to be able to start over. And uh, January 20, uh, 2011, uh, filed bankruptcy. Had my car repo out of my uh, out of my driveway wow. at less than a thousand dollars in my bank account. Um, my wife was pregnant with number three. Uh, that, uh, or let me think, or just had had number three. And, and so, you know, life, life was uh, raw and, uh, you know, had, had a lot to learn from there. And, and, you know, after that, I, I didn't let it scare me. I, I stayed in the entrepreneurial world 
and I started a bunch of different things, anything, anything to make a buck. You know, I was flipping stuff on eBay, flipping cars, houses, I had a coupon book, home security business, a uh, medical pendant uh, business. Uh, so you did not like one or two or three. I mean, everything. Yeah. You over until you, wow. Yeah. Guys, I listen. Search, hired a search engine optimization business. I mean, dude, you name y it. Y'all got to, y'all got to take this lesson here. Okay. Because you hear Chris's story and you think $250 million a year, PE acquisition, all these things, right? Like this guy's a genius and you're a smart guy, right? And, and, and you've learned a lot. You've ass assimilated an enormous amount of wisdom that was not present in the beginning. It became present through the process that you went through to acquire it, right? Like you just kept swinging the bat. So, so, so I have to ask you this, where did that come from? So, so that, that ability to take several, sounds like false starts, right? Mm -hmm. And not think like, man, I'm just not cut out for this. Or maybe God doesn't want me to do this. Or maybe, where did that drive to say, okay, that didn't work. Let's try again. Where did that come from? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're uh, you're making me emotional. Um, just th just thinking thinking on stuff. So uh, you should be. You've overcome an enormous amount, and you've done something really special, and you've improved a lot of people's lives. And you've done that in the face of adversity that ninety nine point nine percent of people simply would not do. I'm a little emotional too, listening to you talk about it. So, you know, my, my dad, my dad taught me an incredible work ethic. Um, he, he was an extremely disciplined investor. He invested half of his paycheck, even though he was only making 60 grand a year. Wow. And, uh, wasn't, wasn't the smartest. He was in a 401k, right? It was what he knew. Um, and so from an early age, I, I had a job, uh, age nine, I got my first job age 12. I was expected to provide for everything, but, uh, um, but, but food on the table and, and, uh, underwear. And so, um, you know, early on I had to learn a certain level of self-reliance. Um, but as far as like pushing through difficulties, sports is probably what taught me the most growing up. So, um, and, and I actually carry, uh, this, this lesson I'll share with you uh, today. It's actually in my Instagram handle. So Chris, I, I don't know why I'm getting emotional about this, but, but Chris, Chris Lee QB. So, um, that, that was the, that was the very first, uh, email I ever had was chrisleyqb at hotmail.com. And, uh, cause I grow, growing up, I always played quarterback. My dad was the high school uh, football coach. I loved the quarterback position. I love being a leader. And, and so, uh, my whole life was designed and, and set around like being a state champion in football. And like, I had, I had it, you know, from like age eight up on my wall, there's two things I want more than anything. Uh, one was a celestial marriage, which is what we believe is, 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 uh, finding our eternal companion. And then two was winning a state championship. And so everything I did was, was, was designed around that, you know, the backyard football. I was always the quarterback. That, that was it. And, uh, you know, I, I went and I, I was, you know, doing all the camps and everything else. I was the starting quarterback all the way through sophomore year. I'm a backup quarterback uh, to the varsity quarterback. I throw seven touchdowns on varsity coming in as, as a sub. I'm having a great, great year. And then my junior year comes and uh, the, the, the starting quarterback had graduated and, and uh, had this great goal of going and winning a state championship. And uh, there was a sophomore kid that was very athletic and uh, never really had played much quarterback before, but he was an extreme athlete, 6'4", 215 pounds, just like the perfect like D1 uh, person. And uh, he, he ends up beat, beating me out for the starting position. I'm a junior, he's a sophomore. And uh, it, was, it was like one of the, it was the, it was one of the most difficult things I've ever gone through in my life. Um, and it, and it, I know that sounds stupid to say, having, having like gone through like way more difficult things from, but, but like it, I, I'd taken like uh, my, my boy, my boyhood dreams of being a starting quarterback and winning a state championship that I had, that I had just pictured and envisioned from, for like most of my life. And, and it, they were, they were dashed. 
and my junior year, like, uh, I, I, it was really hard for me to recover. Like I sat on the bench, I played less than I did as a sophomore. Um, like, and it began to actually impact me physically. I started having back problems. I started to, like, like all, all these things. Um, and, uh, and so like after that season, I had a choice to make, like, Hey, am I going to continue to just self pity and, and allow others to decide whether or not I was successful or was I going to actually take serious the goals that I had set from an early age and and allow myself to to recover? And, and maybe it was a different route. And so I decided that um, it was a different route in which I was going to go and win that state championship. And so I said, screw it. I'm not going to let the coaches decide. I'm going to go hit the weight room. I'm going to put on a lot of weight, and I am going to become a lineman. And uh, and so I, I, I went from from being the backup quarterback to the starting right guard uh, for, for our team. And I was also, also the starting middle linebacker. Uh, and so my senior year, I started both ways. We ended up winning the first ever state championship in, in, our, in our school's history. And, wow. uh, but, uh, and, and I know it's stupid to get emotional about this stuff, but like, but what, what that taught me was like, you may, you may have goals or whatnot, but typically the road to hitting those goals isn't what you had imagined. Yeah. Right? And, and so, and so for me, it was like pushing, pushing through those failures of, you know, things that I had been a shortcoming or, or uh, things that people had forced upon me, decisions of other coaches or whatever else. And, and just not allowing that event to control the outcome. I love, I love, uh, uh, Urban Meyer, his book Above the Line, he talks yep, about great e, book. e plus R equals O, right? You got the event and then your response wow. determines the outcome. And so for me, it was controlling that response at an early age and realizing that no matter what the event is, I can still get the outcome that I desire. And so, you know, we, we ended up having a, a fantastic year, but foundationally, that was an experience that impacted me for the rest of my life. And yeah. so, when I was filing bankruptcy and having my car repoed, like I, I just, I just thought back to the dark times of like, of like having to decide, like, am I going to allow this event to determine the outcome? Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, like, like I said, kind of, kind of a dumb story, but like for me, just such, a, such an emotional time, and and to this day, like I said, I, I keep, I keep the QB thing. To, yeah. to remember yeah you're reminding that, yourself to remind myself and, and in fact it was interesting i ended up going and coaching high school quarterbacks for seven years because i was a phenomenal i was a phenomenal coach and quarterback i just wasn't better than this guy um so you know it's it's something that i continue to keep and 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 uh it's my moniker and yeah that, that's what drives me that my friend is an amazing story thank you for sharing that it's so interesting because you're like, hey, this wasn't the hardest thing in my life by any stretch of the imagination, but it felt that way. But what's so interesting is you were least prepared. It was the first time you had to come face to face with this decision. And what's interesting is even though you went through arguably much more challenging situations later in life, it was the preparedness from that first situation that made it even today maybe seem like not as big of a deal, which is so interesting because people want things in life to be easier and they don't ever get easier, but we can get better. Right. It's the we don't control the events a lot of times like the E plus R. Right. But we do control our responses. And, and uh, you know, it, it's a mentality really of there's a way. Right. Like that's what I hear. Like, hey, it, it doesn't maybe look the way I think it looks. And we could talk for an hour on that. One of the things that I always tell people is that's that's how God works in our lives. Right. Like like he brings us things that don't look many times the way we think they're going to look. My first business. I didn't know anything about it. Never been in business, knew nothing about finance, knew nothing about sales. All I knew is I was broke, but open-minded. And here comes this thing that was a $40 million deal for me over, over, you know, a 15 year period of time. And it, it didn't look anything like I expected it to. In fact, if I would have been gun ho on doing the things that I thought it was going to be, who knows where I'd be. Right. And so there's so many powerful truths there. So, you know, you, you sold the business, you're chairman now, and you, you're leading the founder project, which is amazing. I love what you're doing, right? Because here's the fact, there's a lot of gurus out there. One of the things I love about you is you have lived this on both sides of the equation, not so great and really great. And the world needs people like you because there's all sorts of people who are good at marketing, who are good at getting email lists, who are good at selling the sizzle, but they have not really ever built anything great 
and they've never really failed in any great way, right? And and so you're out here, the Founder Project, investing into the lives of people who are chasing their dreams. And talk a little bit about that. I know there's several tiers to it. I know that you do consulting for equity. I know you've got the Founders Podcast, which is doing amazingly well right now. And you've got masterminds and all sorts of things, but just, you know, the last couple of minutes together, what inspired you to do that? What are you, what difference are you hoping to make in the world? And then how do people connect with you on your journey there, Chris? Yeah, you bet. So first of all, like the, the thing that I've always been most passionate about is building people. As I talked about, like the reason why Soul Gen blew up the way it did was because of focus on people. And so like, I've always been very intrigued by masterminds and events and like I've, I've attended many of them. I spent over a million dollars on my personal education. Uh, you know, the, that, that is the thing that like where I get the most fulfillment. And it so happens that I get to make some money doing it too, which is cool. But like, that's more of an afterthought. You know, I tried, I tried the, uh, the whole retirement thing for about six weeks. <laughs> that doesn't work. I did it too. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> and quickly I found like an identity crisis of who I was and everything else. And, you know, I wanted, I did it for all the right reasons. I wanted to go and spend a bunch more time with my wife and kids. But then I realized, man, I cannot spend an extra 60 to 70 hours a week with my wife and kids. I can do another 20 hours, but I got to yeah. find some for these other 40 to 50. And, and so, you know, for me, it's been growing and developing things. Like that's what gets me excited, gets me juiced and gets me out of bed and, and uh, really helping people. I love, I love business because a, a, a real business helps people. And, and so like the, the focus has been, we, we have a bunch of different things. We have front end stuff. I, I do my founder podcast. It's top, I think it's number 33 right now on the charts in, in business. Uh, and then, and then on top of that, we do what's called founder acceleration, where we meet three times a month with founders and entrepreneurs or people that are trying to build businesses or do great things. Um, it, it, and we do it, it's super cheap. It's like 500 bucks a month. You meet with us three, three times we get together, we do hot seats and Q and A's and, and it's me running the group. It's not me farming it out to somebody else. And, and so it like, that's where I find my passion. And, and, and on top of that, we host really cool in-person masterminds. We go to my place in Hawaii or we got a, a place up in the mountains of Idaho. We get together intimate group and, and we dive in and we talk about, uh, personal lives and business and, and, and really like figuring out what's working, what's not working. And, and like that for me, it's like, it's like business therapy. It's the, it's the coolest thing in, in the world. Uh, and then, and then on top of that, we, we consult and we, and we, and we do those type of things. And so like this for me is like the rest of my life, like yeah. I'm designing something that I can do for the rest of my life. It's not an enterprise value type business that I'm going to pick up and sell like, like my previous businesses. But this, this is like, all right, what is Chris Lee and what is the thumbprint and the impact that he's going to leave on the world once he's gone? And, yeah. and so, so yeah, that, that's where, where the passion is. As far as where people can find me, uh, once again, on, on a social at Chris Lee QB, like quarterback. Uh, and that's on every major channel is Chris Lee QB, uh, YouTube, all stuff, and then the Founder Podcast and, and, and so on and so forth. Chris, I meet a lot of people and um, you were one of the most genuine guys that I've met in a long time and it shines through and, and you can tell your love for the Lord and for your family and for doing things the right way. And that's a, that means a lot to me. Um, and it, it's, it's so funny because we have similar paths in our life, right? Um, exited businesses and, you know, really could be pretty okay forever, but sort of just drawn magnetically back into building people. Right. right. Like that, that is my life's calling is to build people who are around me, whether that's my family, my neighbors, my community, my war room group, my whatever that is. Right. And it's so interesting because it is not an enterprise level value proposition. I mean, it, it can be if you automate it and you get other people, but then you lose what we're there for, right. which is to sit face to face with somebody and watch them become who they were born to be. Right. And to, to play some little role in that. So that's really, really powerful. Guys, listen, make sure to go follow Chris. OK, stop what you're doing now and go follow him. Don't wait. Do it now. OK, because you're going to forget about it. And, and you don't want to forget about this. You don't want to forget about watching what, what he has to tell you, because it, it's the real deal. It's not fluff. It's coming from experience and more importantly than experience coming from experience with a great heart. And, and the right motivation. And, and that's a really, really special thing. And check out, check out the, the entire movement around uh, the, the founders 
uh, idea that he's working on, whether that's the podcast, that's a definite must, or the masterminds, right? Get around people like Chris that are doing something big with their life, that have the fruit, have the challenges, have overcome them, done it for a long time, and are in the right position, loves their family, loves the Lord. I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. There's a lot of guys out there with incomplete pictures, right? And and the, the guys you follow, you got to be careful because you're going to end up like them. Right. And so I always want, I had mentors early in life that I looked at and married to the same person for 40 years, great kids, wealthy pillars in the community. Everybody respected them. I said, man, if I could be half of that sort of man, when I, when I get there, I, that would be all I could ever want. And, and so you're obviously well on your way there. And so Chris, thanks for your time today. Everybody go follow Chris now. Thank you again to all of our uh, audience who's uh, listening, tuning in uh, week after week. Thank you so much. I know this was a value to you. And until next time, we'll see you soon.